I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today I'm continuing with section 4.6 of The Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri. In 4.6 we will be finishing Book 1, Religion as Simulation. Revelation, Invention, Creation. Synopsis. Life and consciousness will not touch upon the total radiance of the divine through revelation, but through creational genesis. Revelation does not give us a god, only a blueprint for his creation. Religion is not a revelation, but a powerfully inspired invention, inspired by the blossoming sacramentality of man's conscience. As a dilettante theologian, I have been tinkering with the ambitious notion of a universal church. In looking around for an instrument of instruments capable of this religious unification, I stumbled on the apostasy, or perhaps heresy, of seeing the many existing theologies as instruments themselves. Not that the churches are instruments of God, but that those gods themselves are instruments constructed by the mind and soul of man. This conclusion didn't come about neatly and suddenly, but was the product of a persistent state of dissatisfaction and a certain amount of probing. The churches seem to be the means through which the instrument God affects man. As a parallel and balancing factor came the realization of the necessity of churches, and often the intensity of their sacramentality. But the god of these churches could not divest itself of its true garments, its instrumental nature. The churches will not surrender their status as the closest upholders of the revelation of an extant reality, the true god. Yet, this revelation cannot be the word of God for the simple reason that God is not, and God is not because God is in the making. God is not as a house is not, even when only a sketchy outline of it is conjectured, God is not as a house is not, even when the process is much further along and wells and roofs are constructed. God is, however, in the same sense that premonition, will, design, and partial existence document the advent of a completed, functioning house. The key concept can be stated as follows. Religion, a theological structure, is a human design, not conceived around revelation, but conceived around a longing, which prompted man to construct the simulation of a possible future reality. If by revelation is meant the discovery of an existing supernatural reality, and if by simulation is meant an invented process by which the future can be prognosticated, then religion is based on simulation, not revelation. Religion is something which stands for something else and which does not as yet exist. Conceding the above, one is struck by the following implications. 1. There is no longer a just and loving power to turn to when things are out of hand. 2. There are no longer two responsibilities in consequent moral knots, A, God responsibility, and B, man, life's responsibility. 3. There is no longer access, vicarious or direct, to past perfection, free of pain and sorrow. 4. There is no longer access to salvation at the end of the personal experience of life, nor is there the threat of personal damnation at such end. 5. There is no one true God who is the God of one's own church, and a false God who is the God of other churches. 6. There are no longer the words spoken by God or by his spokesman. There are the words of men, good men, and bad men, and their deeds. This is, in a way, a belief in God, but a God who does not exist as yet. The position is, thus, as far apart from the orthodoxy of religion as it is from the dogmatism of the non-believer, the atheist. If it is true that in most religions there is a current of futurism, a tension which is achievement-oriented, It is also true that central to all religions is the assumption that one or more gods are overseeing the whole of reality, god or gods who are more than what they watch over. On the other hand, the concept of religion as simulation, see religion as simulation, stands on the premise that such god or gods are not really there, which is why man had to invent them and then had to write the parts that such gods have played and are going to play. In the simulation theology, there are incremental conditions of sacredness that can be labeled as gods of certain limited powers. Since such gods are subject to the evolutionary flow, aspects of their power become obsolete, and they are superseded by more evolved gods, more inclusive gods. Never at any instant are there one or more gods who are beyond extant reality for the simple reason that the two are but one and the same thing differently interpreted. This religion does not fit many of the pantheistic molds, since the pressure which characterizes it is the need to transcend whatever it is up to that point. Transcendental action is ill-fitting to the harmony of these pantheistic scenarios. 
How does a theological simulation come about? Since man is an inventive species, it would be strange if he did not, sooner or later, turn to the greatest challenge of all, how to extend one's own life beyond one's own life, and to invest in the process the greatest of all structures, God. Since we are not dealing with reality, but with an engrossing hypothesis about the future, what is the efficacy of a theological simulation? It's more than that of being a rail on which evolutionary momentum can develop. There's an imminent element in the invention simulation theology, which stands for nothing less than the essence of the living phenomenon. If in this theology the outlook on the future is but hypothetical or anticipatory, the past, in contrast, is eventful and concrete. But, by an inversion of the perspective of orthodoxy, what we see is that there is in the past something we like to call a god to return to. This father god is none other than the limitless polytheism of the mass-energy universe. Then, contrary to the orthodox view, there is a sun god to be created incrementally through the evolutionary process, and to be fully expressed at the end of time. Indispensable to this process is sustenance of the thrust which transforms matter into conscious matter, spirit, and continual increase in its momentum and magnitude. Few men in different times and different places built theologies whose nature was to be in place of something desirable which wasn't there. They built theologies as a function of the condition of man there and then, his longings, his terrors, his hopes, his fears, his power, his grace, and his temptations. With those elements as a basis, they constructed models for the future as a technician builds models of mechanisms possibly capable of performing given tasks. A way, perhaps the only way, to sanction such theologies, such models, to put them in beyond doubt, ridicule, and chastisement, was to make them oracular, that is to say, revealed. But revelation is only that which is revealed by the author of the revelation to the receiver of the revelation. There is no malice inherent in the ambiguity of the invention and simulation, which is called revelation. When one believes strongly enough in what one is doing, one becomes possessed by it. In that state of being, a mental construction can well strike the soul as revelation. In countless instances, man hears voices from within that he sincerely believes must come from without or from a within which is more, much more profound than one's own. If, to keep the theology legitimate, there had been the need of a revelation and thus necessarily an author for it, God, then there was no room for doubt that such an author had to exist. Once the theology is accepted as revelation, God exists because only he who exists can reveal. Inescapably then, religion had to be turned upon the past. God is because God has always been. The best thing man can do for himself is to hope to join the eternally blissful being someday, somehow. The return into the Father is the main objective of man, the reaching towards a condition of perfection and fulfillment as a reentry. This is why and how man made a gigantic step backward as he was making a gigantic leap forward, a retreat behind the shield of revelation so as to avoid ridicule or stoning, while declaring for himself the power, invention, simulation of a prediction and of self-fulfilling prophecy? The consequence of such expediency is part of the burden everyone has to carry. Could this burden be the closest approximation of the concept of original sin? An original sin in reverse to be guilty not of having bitten the fruit of knowledge, but of lacking the courage, after the tasting, to accept the knowledge and what it would give to man. Demonism and anguish together with brief explosions of joy. The sin is in glossing over man's debts towards life, the immense responsibility of inventing sacredness and becoming. In so doing, the prime mover of consciousness, understandable ding, knowledge, love, and creation. To invent sacredness was to become aware that with life a new dimension was being added to reality, the dimension of consciousness p compassion. Among the components of consciousness are joy and sorrow, elation and pain. With them was to come forth reverence, and with reverence the necessity to proselytize the sacred through the universe, a mandate as inescapable as the thrust that keeps life begetting more life. To proselytize the sacred means to cause sensitivity where sensitivity is not, to sensitize the universe, to inspire the metamorphosis of mass energy into spirit. It may have been hubris for the founders of religions to demand that the whole world be converted then, when the center of the whole world was the earth. Now that this whole world is the cosmos, which astronomers, physicists, and mathematicians conjecture about, to proselytize sensitivity throughout it is exponential hubris, a quasi-grotesque gesture out of proportion with the miserable minuteness of the earth and its spirit. But the real question is, does life have any alternative to this responsibility? I think not. With the onset of consciousness, a progressive and potentially immense dislocation of power had begun to work its effect in the granularity of the physical universe. It is the power of a god in the making, a power which has moved, which transubstantiated from a reality dominated by statistical laws to a reality constructing ever more compassionate events. 
It is fate, so to speak, transfigured into destiny, the destiny of convergence into the Omega God, the God hypothesized by the simulative efforts of theology. There's much more talk today of a religion of action, of commitment, as if there were another kind of religion. And indeed, for a theology which depends on an a priori God, action and commitment may only increase the distance from the eternal self-same God. For this theology, there's a grain of truth in the Lutheran contention that faith alone will suffice for the return of a sinner to the Father, inasmuch as this view tends to limit the durational thinking of action. On the contrary, in the fulfillment of the simulation prophecy and the process of God creation of creating a God, it is action, the true action of transformation, transfiguration of the existing that is the only path taking man and life into the divine. The most in a priori God can demand a man is inspired stewardship, the, God, the good keeper doing the will of the master which includes the laundering of God's dirty linen, sufferance, toil, the amendment of his mistakes and shortcomings. It will not do. It will not do, notwithstanding the clamorings of the pious and the priests, the conservationists, and the nostalgic. Spirit is a demonic thrust which cannot stand appeasement or quiescence. The demonic component is inherent in a process which knows that more sensitization implies with more joy, more sufferance. The soil which becomes a leaf, which becomes flesh, which becomes passion, which becomes spirit, necessarily produces sufferance. The sufferance of living and living in ways increasingly dense in events, in contrast to the non-sufferance of a soil deaf to the call of sensitization. The sufferance of a cracked stone and the sufferance of a cracked skull do not compare. Sensitization, the miracle brought forth by the complexity of the living organism, is the chasm separating the two. Nothing might be more necessary to break the existential indifference of today's man than to make him sense his responsibility as God-maker. As soon as he forfeits such responsibility, he becomes God-breaker. It is my contention that the new religion humankind needs is a religion of God-making, a continuous realization of the responsibility bearing on any and all thinking beings for taking charge of the evolutionary thrust by putting into it their own personal component in a manner each can handle a bit more. The God of infinite love and infinite beauty will be, if and when we will, it with all of our strength. The more our ways are devious and our souls dried up, the further away in the future moves the advent of such a divine hypothesis. The God of infinite love and infinite beauty is seminal within ourselves. It is our responsibility as God-makers. This action will, in time, pervade the universe. We cannot dismiss the immensity of the task and, therefore, the necessity of a humble, a correspondingly immensely humble attitude toward that which makes the world's condition of unreserved reverence. To release ourselves from the bonds of past-oriented theology, it would help if we could make and maintain a clear distinction between nostalgia and religion. Since many emotive notions are nostalgic, fatherland, those were the good old days, etc., and since religious notions are highly emotional— we can be, and often are, easy prey to states of being which nostalgia and religion intermix and taint each other. The mixture is explosive, not necessarily in constructive ways, since it is a past-oriented mixture. As a has-been Catholic, I cannot separate the Catholic Church from nostalgia for the events of childhood and youth. One's emotional bias for the rights of one's own church, is, at the expense of an equitable assessment of other religions' rights, is too evident to need long consideration. There is then... An emotional block to rationalization, the imprint left by events that touch the psyche before the mind can make any assessment of a logical, rational nature. One is them rationalizing a posteriori under the a priori constraint of psycho-emotional nature. In this ever-existing condition, leaders, good and bad, find the handles with which to hold the masses, us, whiteness, blackness, Christ, Muhammad, fatherland, etc., Religion as part of the experience of any individual has such a hold, and each of us must try to deal with its power, since it is really a holding power on our being, and thus is a molding power on our becoming. It is therefore quite understandable that my proposition of a potential Omega God, some fragments of which are imminent in the present, strikes as heresy of the grossest kind, or as a useless exercise in hubris. To those who say that life struggle is but a struggle of re-entry into the Father by a prodigal progeny, I say no. There's only one outcome of re-entry. It is the loss of consciousness, the loss of spirit, the loss of life, since the Father is nothing else than the immensely dumb, if immensely grandiose universe of mass energy, the Alpha God. To those who say that turmoil is illusory because sameness is the true nature of the universe, a universe imbued with beatitude, I say no. There is a seminal and fundamental anguish that is manifested throughout nature as soon as such nature becomes organic. Such anguish is the pain of incompleteness suffered by a living creature for which self-sameness is nothing but annihilation. Nirvana is not a paradise lost. It is an abandoned equipment yard since life God has moved to higher ground. 
So those who say that pure senselessness characterizes both the mineral and organic world, that where indifference is substituted by sufferance and joy is where irrationality supplants senselessness, I say no. Senselessness and indifference belong to the polytheistic kingdom of the Alpha God. Sufferance and joy belong to the tide of consciousness sweeping away the senselessness of the mineral world into the cognition creation of a future God. To those who say that today the present is all there is, that a day stolen away from sufferance and death is all that counts because it is all that man can be hoped for, I say no. The present eminence is the synopsis of the past, the synopsis measuring how much of the Omega God has achieved or fulfilled. It's the springboard for those next achievements and fulfillments which will inch closer to the full divinity hypothesized by man and his religions. To those who say that the universe is a perfect engine with, with which the intellect, given free reign, can overconstruct a super engine, a shining, polished, rational, logical, mathematical, quintessential structure running itself for itself, I say no. The splendor of the spirit is not made of reductionist mechanisms. If it does make use of them, as it does with technology, as it also it is also beyond them. It is an effect whose cause could not be found in a self-fulfilled mechanistic universe, but rather in a universe whose deprivation was the spark for a chain of events in which every effect was transcendental of its own cause. The successive splendors of a becoming escaping ever more powerfully from the claws of entropic and statistically driven reality. To those who say that the divine spark, which develops as life develops, is but a mirror of the divine splendor of a pre-existing god, I say no. There is a divine spark developing, and such a divine spark is the life spark, and there is no other. To everyone, I would say that what we are is no more than a premonition of what will be, ought to be. If we absorb the fire of prophets and holy men, the journey has hardly begun. Life is an infinite God, plagued by strong drives and inexperience, by physical hunger obfuscating the budding hunger of the spirit, the impatient infant God, a seeker more than achiever, a humbling God, a fumbling God, often and easily mystified by an immensely powerful and awesomely beautiful cosmos. The cruelties of the infant God are of the same nature as the cruelties of any infant. The infant is a totally self-centered organism blessed by a double luck. A mother is there willing to put up with the little beast, and the infant has evolutionarily achieved a physiological automatism which prevents it from self-destruction. It is indeed this perfect robot which unflinchingly demands nurturing and attention for survival. In the infant there is no limit to the indifference toward the sufferance of others. The ego is the center of the universe. All else is for it or against it. Much the same as the behavior of infant life, humankind included. Racial drives, for instance, have the same self-centered fury. Under various pretenses, we group ourselves in infant societies and we strike out, obsessed by fear, driven by the need to ensure survival and dominance in the face of an enemy, which is seldom where we think it. In the process of growing up in quest of the self, life will shed the ego. The infant terrible will begin to have a more reverent perception of itself, while acquiring a firmer and more compassionate grasp of the blind and dumb reality of the physical universe. The infant god will increasingly radiate the grace of its sufferance, since sufferance will have been the bread and wine nurturing its emergence. Thus concludes section 4-6. Thus concludes Revelation, Invention, Creation. Thus concludes Book 1, Religion as Simulation. Tomorrow we will continue with section 4-7 of the Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri, beginning with book 2, An Eschatological Hypothesis. I will see you then. Alam.